Good morning and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival this year in a special hybrid form. My name is Matt Vidmar and it is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Mark Woolhouse, who will be speaking to us today about whether things will ever get back to what they were before COVID and whether the changes we experience might be for the best. After Mark's talk, we'll take some questions too. As, my, you, must, as you might be already accustomed to, this year the questions can be sent in via Slido. If you go to www.slido.com and use the code at the bottom of the screen, or if you just scan the QR code that's now been shown on your screens, you can join us and submit any questions throughout the talk. You can, you can also add, add your questions, questions directly onto the YouTube chat itself, and they'll be passed on to Slido too. too. But, but now, now let me introduce you to today's speaker. speaker. Professor Mark Woolhouse is, is Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the University of Edinburgh. Of Edinburgh. He studied at the Universities of Oxford and York and Queen's in Canada, and then, and then held, held research, research fellowships at the University of Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe Imperial College London, and at Oxford. Oxford. He, was he was a member, member of the Scottish government's COVID-19 advisory group, and, and his book, the, the year the world went mad, covers, covers the event of 2020 and the, and the reasons why we ended up in lockdown. Well, well as, as this, this year we all went back, back Mark is here to discuss what is and isn't the same. same. Mark, Mark over, over to you. Thank you very much. As uh, you just heard, the title, The Year the World Built Mad, uh, of the book is uh, a retrospective look at the pandemic. Uh, this talk is forward looking. Uh, I'm very sorry it can't happen actually in Orkney, but hopefully the virtual format works very well for everyone. Uh, and I want to talk about what the next pandemic might or might not look down, and particularly whether or not we might end up back in lockdown again. I'd have the next slide, please. So let's remind us ourselves as if we needed reminding of just how serious the COVID-19 pandemic was. Globally, there were well over 6 million confirmed deaths due to the disease and probably more than 18 million. That's the best estimates that have been published recently. So that, that's a huge toll. And of course that is added to by an enormous burden of, of acute illness many, many more people than that ending up in hospital or needing hospital care, and chronic illness too in the form of long COVID. So there's no question that the, the public health burden has been absolutely enormous. And in many countries around the world, and something that we came close to here in the UK, healthcare systems were overwhelmed. But in addition to that, there were a whole number of indirect consequences. Schools and universities were closed in some countries for two years or more, so enormous damage to education. The economic harm was immense. The UK took on an extra three or four hundred billion pounds of public debt in the first year alone. We had a dramatic reduction in GDP and many people lost their businesses and lost their livelihoods. There's no question that the pandemic is one of the contributors to the current economic woes that we're all facing. A huge but much more difficult to quantify burden of mental health harms, particularly concentrated uh, in the young, and that's becoming more and more apparent over time. And of course, for all of us, normal life was suspended uh, for months at a time. The, the long-term damage of all this is still being assessed, but it's quite clear it was immense. Next slide, please. The worry, of course, is that this pandemic, serious though it was, is, is part of a long-term trend. The map there with the black dots upon it is a World Health Organization illustration of the distribution of outbreaks of what they call emerging infectious diseases. So, so ones that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see in that place at that time, uh, but nevertheless caused a public health problem. Now, there's a lot of, lot of black dots on there, but thankfully the great majority of these are minor and self-limiting events uh, of, of unusual diseases, but some of them are more serious. And the World Health Organization has a category called the Public Health Emergency of International Concern, which is basically a precursor to a pandemic. And since that device was introduced, it's activated it a number of times for swine flu, for polio, for Ebola twice, for the Zika virus and for COVID-19, of course, and most recently of all for monkeypox. And there's no 
question that we would expect that there will be more public health emergencies of international concern coming along in the not too distant future. Now, of that list, the ones that have been declared so far, only COVID-19 caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a new and previously unknown disease. All, all the others we did know about, but we got these uh, dramatic outbreaks that were a concern. And this concept of the next pandemic being caused by something new is known as disease X. This is something that I played a role in developing the concept of disease X at World Health Organization meetings back in 2017 and 18. And we're all agreed that COVID-19 will not be the last disease X. There will be other new threats coming along. So how are we going to respond to them? Next slide, please. Well, it won't surprise anyone to learn that a huge number of governments, government agencies, international bodies have been trying to answer that question in the last year or two. You could probably paper the walls of your living room with these reports that have been coming out on a regular basis uh, from organizations like the International Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, from the G7, from the G20, from the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, or uh, from scientific funders like the Wellcome Trust. They've all contributed to this debate. So there's a lot going on in this space. Next slide, please. And one of the th things that most of those reports I just listed concentrate on is something called the 100 days mission. Now, the 100 days starts from the day that the World Health Organization declares a public health emergency, and it applies to the development trials and approvals of new technologies to combat the new threat. And it sets a target of having these tools approved within 100 days. And the kind of tools we're talking about here are diagnostics, therapeutics, so drugs or treatments for the new disease, uh, and for vaccines. And what I've shown on this slide is the delay between the public health emergency being declared and those tools coming online during the last pandemic. And you will see from the numbers there that stretch up to 200, 300, 600 days for things like new antivirals, that getting this down to 100 days is an ambitious task. The only thing we did within 100 days last time round was develop the RT-PCR test, which is extremely useful and important development, uh, but not by itself a cure to, for the pandemic. So this is a very ambitious target. Next slide, please. The problem is, that that's for the deployment, the first deployment of the new technology, it's not for rollout. And to understand the importance of that further step in the pandemic response, let's think about when mass vaccination began in the UK. That was December the 8th, 2020. That was already remarkable that we had an effective vaccine, that we started a mass vaccination campaign with it within well under a year of the pandemic being recognized. But that wasn't the end to the pandemic in the UK or anywhere else. Restrictions were not removed until the, uh, in, in the UK or certainly in England, the Freedom Day of July 19th took a little longer in Scotland, well over 200 days later. So it wasn't the end of the pandemic. And more important than that, after the vaccine rollout began, actually more than 60% of the COVID-related deaths we record in the UK happened after that. So there's a still an enormous public health burden to be dealt with while the vaccine is being rolled out. Uh, and obviously we can't ignore that. At a global scale, the situation is even more worrying. It took well over 300 days, getting on for a year, before half the global population had had even one dose of vaccine, never mind the second doses or the booster doses uh, that we have here. So that was much, much slower. And of those confirmed COVID deaths that I mentioned earlier, three quarters began after the mass vaccination was available, where the tools were available. So it's not 100 days. It's 100 days plus this interval for rollout. Next slide, please. The only one of those reports I listed earlier that mentions this is the G7 report. And they talk about, in those 100 days, non-medical public health interventions like social distancing, isolation, contact tracing, and PPE are essential. So in other words, the G7 strategy, this, this report was presented by Sir Patrick Vallance, uh, the UK Chief Scientific Advisor, uh, and Melinda French Bates. So they're talking about plugging the gap with these non-pharmaceutical interventions, and particularly social distancing. 
So what might that look like in, the vision of, in this vision of the future? Well, there are two kinds of NPI. One set is about making contact safe, talking about things like hygiene, PPE, physical distancing, ventilations, uh, that we're all very familiar with, and also testing, the ability to detect cases and require the cases and perhaps their contacts to self-isolate, which is a very focused intervention. It doesn't uh, affect anyone except those who are directly exposed to the virus. Uh, and we did all that in the pandemic, but it wasn't the mainstay of our response. We put a lot more emphasis on actually not making contacts safe, but reducing the number of contacts, that is social distancing. So things like work from home, travel bans, border closures, closing social venues, banning social contact, closing schools, and quite rapidly stay at home orders. In other words, lockdown. And therefore lockdown is what the G7 report is referring to when it talks about plugging the gap uh, with non-pharmaceutical interventions. Next slide, please. So where does lockdown fit in our understanding of public health? Well, the Collins Dictionary definition from 2020, they actually made it their word of the year, is that lockdown is the imposition of stringent restrictions on travel, social interaction, and access to public spaces. And the reason we needed a definition of it is we didn't have one. The word didn't really exist before 2020. It wasn't part of a recognized public health strategy, nor was it part of anyone's pandemic preparedness plans. And that immediately, I think, instills in us some sense of humility. I've just talked about all those pandemic preparedness plans we're putting together now, but in 2020, we didn't use them. We used something different. We used something we invented very quickly, and we invented it in China, uh, where a strict lockdown was imposed in Wuhan on January the 23rd, 2020. It worked in a way in that they uh, managed to eliminate the virus, at least temporarily, from Wuhan, uh, but they didn't manage to keep the virus within Wuhan. It spread to the rest of China, and it spread to the rest of the world and, and had done so. Nonetheless, the World Health Organization, as late as February 2020, were endorsing this approach. And they were endorsing lockdown. And it is true that lockdowns can work as part particularly of a zero COVID strategy. That's how they were used in places like New Zealand and Australia and indeed China. But in that context, they're localized and time limited. And the goal is to eliminate the virus and indeed on a global scale to eradicate the virus completely. If that's not feasible, then lockdowns can only delay the epidemic. They, they can't prevent it. That's what came to pass. They, they didn't prevent it. Uh, we ended up with a, a, a series of lockdowns that, that caused delays, but didn't stop the pandemic unfolding in the longer term. And as early as October the 8th, 2020, the World Health Organization's COVID-19 envoy David Navarro was appealing for governments to stop using lockdowns as their primary form of control, although the UK experienced two of them after that date. Next slide, please. This consideration that lockdowns work if you're trying to eliminate and eradicate the virus was completely at odds to what we understood about where we were from very early on in 2020. Epidemiologists like Peter Pio and John Edmonds, both at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, were saying that COVID-19 would become part of the human condition and eventually this would end up as a balance between the levels of immunity in the population, herd immunity, and the, both the infection pressure and the disease pressure uh, of the virus, which in, indeed is what's likely to happen. This was not only understood, it was being modelled. This graph comes from the as graph of the model transition between a pandemic and an endemic disease that was published in one of the world's leading scientific journals called Science in April 2020. The preprint for this paper was actually published in February 2020. So we understood very well from that early on in the pandemic that eradication was not a possibility, that we were going to be living with this virus in one way or another. That transition to a truly endemic state may take some time, and the route by which we get there and the public health challenges that we face on the way remain uncertain. We're still looking to this next winter, not entirely sure what COVID-19 is going to throw at us, um, but it will take quite a long time before, before we get to the fully endemic state. But we knew we were heading there as early as February 2020. Next slide, please. So 
We did lock down anyway, despite the fact that there wasn't any prospect of eradicating the virus. Did it work? Well, uh, lots of people have argued that it did, uh, but that argument depends crucially on what you compare lockdown with. The original case for lockdown in the UK uh, compared lockdown with a scenario where, in the first instance, half a million people might have lost their lives. It was absolutely enormous burden. But that was a scenario where we did literally absolutely nothing. That while hundreds of people fell ill, hundreds of thousands of people fell in and died around us, we did nothing at all. And that's clearly a very misleading comparator. We, we have to compare lockdown with other ways that we might have responded to this virus. Uh, retrospective analysis have now shown that the marginal benefit, certainly the full lockdown in the UK, is likely to be very small, although some dispute about that. And it's certainly true that the Omicron wave, partly with the help of vaccines, was brought under control without lockdown, even though it was spreading very fast. We also knew right from the outset that certain elements of lockdown had very small public health benefit. Outdoor activities were always very low risk. This was established very, very early on in China. Um, despite all the fuss about people going to the beach and everything like that, there were no outbreaks that, that came from those activities. And really, there wasn't any need to keep us indoors. <clears throat> There's also quite a widespread view and growing quite fast that the public health benefit of closing schools is really too small to justify. And indeed, the second wave in the UK was brought under control without closing schools. Could we have done that in the first wave too? The border closures and travel bans, which attracted a lot of publicity and caused a lot of chaos for, for a lot of us, were now widely recognized far too late and largely ineffective. So again, this wasn't a particularly useful public health intervention. Actually, what worries me at least as much of any of all that was that lockdown failed to do what it said it would do on the tin. It failed to protect the most vulnerable people in society. And to give you a statistic, which I have to phrase very carefully to make sure we're clear on what I'm saying here, in Scotland, somewhere between half and three quarters of all the deaths that occurred during the first wave were caused by infections that were acquired during lockdown. So the majority of deaths were infections that were acquired during lockdown. The people who we needed to protect were not, at least not fully, protected by lockdown. Next slide, please. So why, why did we end up in this, in this route? Well, there was a number of unfortunate, I'll use that word carefully, misrepresentations of the challenge we were facing that in my view, weighed the scales of decision-making heavily in favor of lockdown. The first idea was that this was a short-term problem, that the epidemic would be over in the first three weeks, then six weeks were said, and later 12 weeks. Well, that was clearly wrong, and we knew it was wrong. We're now into two years and counting. The other idea uh, that was much publicized in Scotland was the idea that we could eliminate this virus, but that, that was clearly not possible. The virus was well established in Scotland, even by late February 2020, and no country in the world where the virus was established as it was here succeeded in eliminating it. The countries that managed that uh, had not had an established epidemic, uh, thankfully for them. No, we, we were heading for endemicity. And all of this led the politicians to add fuel to the fire. Here, Nicola Sturgeon said, what a very reasonable sounding statement, that no death from COVID-19 is acceptable. But of course, that does mean, imply that you're trying to eliminate the virus. Now we're living with the virus, and it turns out that a, 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 the steady trickle of deaths we're still seeing from COVID-19 is acceptable, after all. Uh, Matt Hancock uh, was saying that the cavalry in the form of vaccination was on the way as early as September 2020. But in practice, although that was true, we still ended up with 10 more months of restrictions. The, the epidemic wasn't anywhere near over. And most insidious of all, uh, Michael Gove was reporting that we're all at risk. And that simply wasn't true at all. Uh, we knew again from very early on that the risk was heavily concentrated in the elderly, the infirm and the frail. 75% of deaths occurred in a very well-defined 5% of the population. And the problem is that all those arguments pushed the public debate firmly in favor of lockdown. And the reality, actually argues against lockdown as being the most sensible intervention. The moral is 
if you want better decision making, you have to have realistic expectations. And I think we didn't do a good job of that in early 2020. Next slide, please. So what would you do for COVID-19 or possibly for any future pandemic to avoid lockdown? Well, better protection of the vulnerable by protecting those around them is crucial. One of the reasons why those vulnerable people were still getting infected during lockdowns is because these are the elderly and the sick. They couldn't effectively fully self-isolate. They needed care. They needed health care. Uh, they needed social care. They needed care in the home. Uh, they had to have contacts. And the way to protect them is to protect the people they're having contacts with and focus their efforts on that. And in fact, in some respects, we do that by, by focusing, for example, early vaccination on healthcare workers. That was a way of protecting the vulnerable by protecting those around them. We also shouldn't underplay the very great benefits of rapidly learning how to deal with patients that are suffering from a new disease. In Scotland, at the beginning of the first wave, the death rate for hospital patients was over 30%. By the end of the first wave, it was under 15. It had more than halved, and particularly better use, better use of medical oxygen, corticosteroids, but also just general care made an enormous difference. And we mustn't underplay just how important that is. COVID safe protocols in workplaces and public spaces work. We know that, for example, both the Scottish Premier Football League and the English leagues successfully completed their football seasons. They did their work, as it were, uh, through COVID safe protocols. And if a football club can do it, I don't see why my own organization, a university, couldn't do it, for example, or many others. Uh, Self-testing and supported self-isolation are focused interventions that are very important and very effective. But there are other places that we could focus our attention to. Infection control and prevention in healthcare settings is vital. We didn't have an enormous effort on that uh, in the UK. I think we could have done better. And biosecurity for care homes, where so many vulnerable people are resident, that was late coming and that's been generally admitted. And that really matters because more than half of the first wave deaths didn't occur in the community where lockdown was effective, they occurred in those settings. So it was a very, very focused risk uh, within society too. And as I said earlier, to get accurate and effective uh, or, or good decisions, you need accurate and effective public health messaging. So this idea that the virus does not discriminate was, was just wrong. It does discriminate and we needed to focus our attention on the people who are most vulnerable to it. And to get there, we need a much more open debate about the pros and cons of any intervention that we think we're going to implement, which I don't believe that we had in early 2020. And the final point, but a really important one, is acting early. A very good maxim for public health when you're dealing with something like an epidemic, an infectious disease, is that early action can be less drastic action. Next slide, please. And we've been working on that. This is an infographic my team at the University of Edinburgh produced for the Scottish government about the timeline of the response to the next Omicron variant. Uh, I won't go into the details, um, but what it shows is that in practice, there was actually government action 10 days after the Omicron, first Omicron variant was detected. And that action was possible because of the rapid flow of information and the excellent links with NHS Scotland data uh, that my colleagues at the University of Edinburgh had by then in order to inform Scottish government decision making and give some sort of assessment of the threat. So we did get much, much better at that than we were at the beginning, and we need to keep it up. We need to have this sort of ambition for future pandemics too. Next slide, please. Would we lock down again, though? Well, that very much depends on what kind of threat we were faced with. We were faced with a respiratory virus. Uh, and those are candidates for lockdown, as I'll come to in a moment, but not all the threats we faced in recent years have been respiratory viruses, they've been quite different. Mad cow disease was foodborne, AIDS, largely by sexual contact, Zika is by mosquito vector, uh, polio is fecally oral transmitted, monkeypox, very close physical contact. And it's not obvious to anyone in public health that, that, that lockdown would be even suggested for those kinds of diseases, that it's not appropriate for those. It wouldn't stop the transmission in a way we would try to do with COVID. Uh, Ebola and hemorrhagic fever, fever viruses like Ebola are transmitted by bodily fluids. So that's very close contact, but there were some elements of social distancing introduced in West Africa. So it's not inconceivable. It might be on the table for those. 
Um, COVID variants, if any new COVID variants do come along, well, yes, clearly lockdowns might be on the table for there, although recently many of the politicians have said they wouldn't introduce them. I'm not sure they'd work. The latest batch of COVID variants and quite possibly the future variants are so transmissible um, that it's not clear that lockdown would even be fully effective against that. We'd have to do something else anyway, as we did with Omicron. The next influenza pandemic, which is a long-standing concern in public health. Well, yes, uh, some elements of lockdown are certainly conceivable, though in the public health planning for influenza, it wasn't called lockdown, and they were certainly much less stringent. And they probably can be much less stringent for a very simple reason. The R number, the, way, the, the, the rate at which the virus spreads in the population for influenza is much uh, lower for influenza than it is for coronaviruses, so much less stringent responses are probably called for. So I'm not sure that a full lockdown would necessarily be the response to pandemic influenza. But the other thing we should all be concerned about is, is SARS-3. The COVID-19 pandemic was caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a very close relative indeed of the original SARS virus that caused a near pandemic in 2003. And I can imagine lockdown being on the table, particularly if as was achieved with the original SARS virus, the goal was to eradicate the virus. But in that case, I would very much hope that we would also have the common sense to say we have failed, if we do fail, to eradicate the virus and that we need to move on to more effective and more sustainable types of intervention. Next slide, please. I'm going to close in a few minutes with a couple of summary points. I put a list of names up here. You, you, you may not be familiar with many of them, but this represents my team at the University of Edinburgh and my colleagues at the University of Edinburgh and elsewhere who have contributed to all the work that's gone into the science underpinning what I've told you today. Uh, and I do want to emphasize that, that science is always a team effort. Uh, and I was very fortunate to have a very good team behind me in 2020. Next slide, please. And I also wanted for the record to put up a list of publications uh, that perform the science, give the scientific evidence for what I have been saying to you today, so that you can check up on that if you would like to. Final slide, please. So what are the key lessons from, from all this? Well, COVID-19 was a catastrophe by, by any standards, but still it was not top of the threat scale. Other viruses we know about are much more deadly, like Ebola, more transmissible, like measles, or move faster, like influenza. So we may face an even greater challenge in the future than we faced in 2020. As I've explained, the 100-day mission is optimistic. I'm an optimist, so I hope it can be met. But even if it is, if we have di effective diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines within 100 days of the next pandemic, the preparedness planning, as I pointed out, is almost silent on how to plug the gap before that vaccine can be deployed, which could easily take another one, 200 days. And to plug that gap, lockdown is not off the table. And in my view, we therefore need to plan to avoid it. I see lockdown less as a public health strategy than a failure of public health strategy. It's what you do if more sustainable types of intervention have failed. If we're going to get there, if we're going to instigate what I regard as more sustainable strategies, we need public health policy and public health messaging that is based on the evidence, something that we didn't do well in 2020. And I come back to this lesson that we should all learn from this about infectious diseases. Early intervention can be less drastic intervention. You can characterize, I think, the response to COVID-19 in the UK in two phases. First, for the first few months, we underreacted and then we overreacted. First, we dithered, then we panicked. Well, next time round, we mustn't dither and we mustn't panic. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so, you so much, much, Mark. Mark. That, that was absolutely fascinating, fascinating and, and you know, quite fast paced. We are doing these talks very quickly, but um, of course, course there's a lot more detail about everything you said in your book and, 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 and published elsewhere. So uh, really, really exciting to hear, hear about um, your kind of, you know, relatively you know, considered, considered view uh, now, now that we've actually lived through both, through both the, the, the lockdown itself as well as coming out, out of it. Of it. Um, We've already, already received some questions, some questions from the audience, including one that I think struck a chord with me as well, and also listening to yourself. 
um, which, um, which is this sort of question of modeling, right? right? A lot of the um, decision making, a lot of the prediction is and, and, and the prevention and the sort of, you know, as you say, you know, the lockdown is the failure of having better uh, public health strategy beforehand. But all of this depends on effectively the data, good modeling. Do you, Do you think, think that there's any particular ways in which we can use advanced, advanced computational tools or, or, or new ways, ways to look at data that would perhaps assist in getting there better, better faster, faster and, and in, a, in a way that would perhaps be more, be more um, preventative, preventative in, the, in, the, in, the in the case of some of, some of these emerging threats, threats that you've just listed? So from a data science point of view, the bottleneck is not so much on the modeling and computation but the data sharing. So in Scotland, we benefited enormously from uh, a data science program led by my colleague Aziz Sheikh at the University of Edinburgh uh, called EVE, which took in the data on COVID-19 from a number of different sources, NHS Scotland uh, and so on, and was able to provide very rapid information on the trajectory of the epidemic and therefore inform the government's response. That program wasn't set up, couldn't be set up for the first six months. And the reason, I'm afraid, is the extraordinarily strict data protocols we have, particularly on data linkage. And while those are there for very sound reasons of data security, they were also a tremendous impediment to actually using data well in the early months of the pandemic. So I, I, I'm not, uh, we can come back perhaps to the, the, the modeling and computation, but it is the data flows that particularly concern me and where we have to do much, much better next time. Indeed. Indeed. Um, I'm, I'm noticing, noticing that, that you know people comment, comment that my microphone is actually the sound, sound coming from me is very bad, bad which I'm not entirely sure, sure what, what that is all about. about. So, but apologies, apologies to all our listeners um, if uh, uh, that might, might be quite uh, quite annoying, annoying to listen to. But, to. but I'll, so I'll try to keep my next, next question even even uh, deeper, deeper, perhaps. Uh, uh, so, do you think that there is you know the the high death rate even with such stringent measures? are more, are more down, down to people's, people's behavior, behavior or just the fact that these measures, measures are unimplementable um, and, and, and really just never, never would have worked? Well, that, that was the point of my statistic and my analysis that more than half, possibly as many as three quarters of the deaths in the first wave in Scotland happened during infections that were acquired during lockdown. I mean, that, that analysis went to SAGE uh, in, in London, um, but it, it it, it wasn't acted on and we continued to behave for the next phase of the, the pandemic as if we could successfully protect the most vulnerable people by suppressing the virus, as it was called, by trying to reduce the R number in the community. And it, it didn't work particularly well. Um, and there were, but yet there was a lot of resistance to the idea of actually concentrating on protecting the people who most needed protecting. And I think we ended up actually in the scientific community with a slightly ideological debate as if, as if the two things were incompatible. And this was never the case. We could always have done more uh, to protect vulnerable populations and vulnerable individuals. We chose not to do it because we put all our eggs in the lockdown basket. And I do think that was a big mistake. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so... so when, when, when we look at the, um, uh, the, the, the current situation, situation right? right? I mean, the, the, the level, level of vaccination and the, and the fact that, you know, you know people, you know, you know there's, there's this assumption that, you know, COVID, COVID is ebbing away, away but as you mentioned, mentioned, there's more threats on the horizon. Um, there, there seems, seems to be still quite, quite a lot of excess mortality, mortality right? right? Are we, are we, are we you, know, you know, and, and this, this idea that the long COVID and all this sort of longer term effects that are kind of persisting in population even after the acute stage of the pandemic has, has, has passed. Is, is there a way to have a, have a better, better preparedness for those kinds of after effects, um, you know, from a, from a population point of view? Yes, there is. And it, it, comes back to this 100-day mission um, because there's good evidence now uh, that the vaccines uh, not only protect against severe disease, but they also, uh, well, and, 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 and including long COVID, which is severe in some people, um, and they do provide extra protection uh, against that. Um, I mean, I work in public health, so I would always advise anyone to try and avoid getting an infection, whether it's COVID-19 or influenza. 
Uh, and that, that's another consideration uh, about the whole lockdown strategy. Lock, lockdown was made compulsory um, and, and legally enforced uh, in many respects. Um, most of us are quite sensible. Uh, and, and most of us will take measures to protect ourselves and the people around them. And most of us were doing that even before the stay at home orders came in. So I, I think the majority of people will take steps to try and reduce their own risk. And I fully support them in doing that. And in the times of a pandemic, I think it's very appropriate that the government supports them uh, in doing that. But that's not the same thing as having it legally enforced that we have to stay in our homes and we have to, we're not allowed outside, even though outside transmission doesn't really occur. Um, so give us the tools and the knowledge to manage our own risk. And I think we'll do a pretty good government, we'll do a pretty good job of it, most of us. In, in, indeed, I mean, I, I remember actually in the, in the early days of the log, log just, just before the lockdown, lockdown there was this sort of big, big debate, debate, you know, going, going in too early into the lockdown, lockdown which of course is already, is already a measure of failure, failure but you know, in, in, either way, the, in, in this particular case, that, that's, that's where we were. were. Uh, there was this idea, idea that, you know, people, people won't, won't stick, stick to it, it right? right? But, actually but actually what has been proven pretty much is that the, the people, people have by and large quite, you know, reasonably stuck to it. And, and, and but it, it just, you know, it just wasn't possible, as, as you said, and, and demonstrated quite clearly. So, so I, I guess the, you know, what, what is the, I mean, what is the lesson in terms of behavioral science? Because, of course, in public health, that is a critical consideration. That, that we should, we should really, really take from that, that. you know, that basically, basically we should trust, trust people more to, to just do their, their to do the right, right thing if they have the right information? Uh, it's a great question. I think one of the first lessons you can learn is that behavioral science is not a predictive science. Um, and I don't think we should necessarily be too critical about that. We were all faced with a completely unprecedented situation that none of us had faced in our lifetimes before. It was hard you know, we didn't know ourselves how we were going to react, never mind for the behavioral scientists to, to make detailed predictions about public level compliance. You're, you're right, the uh, compliance with the restrictions was very, very good, um, but that of course in itself doesn't make the restrictions any less harmful. So that, that doesn't justify them. It just, just says that the, the public did a very good job of managing them. But, but coming back to those early decisions, I really do want to emphasize this argument that early action can be less drastic action. We, we, the later we leave it, the more likely the response has to be lockdown. And that's basically exactly what happened. If we dither, then we have to panic afterwards. Um, and that could have been avoided, although you know, we, we could argue about how much evidence was available when to, to enable that decision to making, that more modest measures earlier would have worked. And, and, and the, you, you can do this with mathematics, but the argument's a really simple one. If you don't let the levels of infection rise up in the first place, you don't have to have such drastic measures to drive them down again. It, it, it's really very, it is that simple. Um, so I think we could have avoided lockdown in principle anyway, in March, 2020, if we had taken more measures earlier, well short of lockdown. Oh, you, oh, you advised the uh, Scottish government, government and, and we're, we're not going to go into politics here necessarily, but of course there are some challenges in the current sort of, you know, the global world, but also within the context of the current sort of, you know, UK configuration, where certain, some decisions are taken in, in, in you know, nationally across the UK and some decisions are kind of taken at sort of, uh, a Scottish level, and of course there's also decisions taken at the sort of local health board level. Um, so, so do, I mean, do you see that, that, that advice and that, and that sort of strategic understanding that, you know, you've just outlined, and I think, it, it, you know, it, it, it would be something sensible, or something you hope that is available to all decision makers at all levels. Do you see that there's actually, you know, you know there's, there's also challenges in making that advice coherent across these different, um, these different government levels, because they're, you know, also advised by different people in different groups and, and in different institutional settings? Is there, is there maybe, maybe also, also a lesson, lesson about how we, how we do public, public policy around kind of, kind of, you know, public health, health uh, that, that would prepare, prepare us better for to respond, as you say, more agilely sooner and perhaps with more modest and not so drastic. Well, I, uh, I am fully engaged with trying to say something sensible about future pandemic threats. I'm certainly not going to speculate on the future political state of the, of the union, uh, anything like that. Uh, within the UK, and certainly within Scotland, it is true that we paid an enormous amount of attention to differences in the pandemic response and differences in national epidemics. 
If you take a step back and look at Scotland and the rest of the UK from a global point of view, no one is discussing that. The differences are so small, both in case in, in the way the pandemic unfolded and in our response to it. They're there, they're, they're, but they're really small. I don't, I don't think anyone else would even notice them. Um, so, so basically, we, we did handle it not as a completely unified response, but it, it, from the virus's point of view, I don't think it took much notice of those uh, relatively small political differences and policy differences. Uh, you know, there are major differences in what happened in other countries. You know, there, 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 there are some uh, significant uh, comparisons to be made, but between Scotland and the rest of the UK, they're really small differences. So, so, but then, again, on, on a global level, right? So, is there a, is there a way? I mean, the World Health Organization has played a significant role in in both communicating the available um, science and data uh, across the world, as well as um, advising from a relatively public point of view the, the you know the, the, the you know what are available measures and what are desirable measures for you know, countries to take. Um, so, is, is there a way to perhaps make that global response more? coherent and homogeneous or is that just a, 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 a facet of geopolitics that you know people you know the different countries will make in the end, in the end their own decisions and, and in a current, current in the way that the world is interconnected there's just nothing to do to you know you know uh, mitigate, mitigate against that well the world the world is interconnected and we have to be very aware of that but that doesn't mean that the world health organization doesn't have an enormously important role to play uh un unfortunately I think many people would say it didn't play that role to full effect in 2020 and got some of the big calls rather wrong. And that's not just my view. I mean, certainly some of the uh, reports, international reports on the WHO response have been very critical uh, of what it did. Uh, yes, so, so yes, there is room for improvement. Um, one of the things that would have made a difference early on according to all, all the epidemiological analysis has done, is a much, much earlier implementation of basically a global shutdown on international travel. Now that came piecemeal uh, from maybe February, but well into March and later in the, it's much too late by then. Um, so that decision would have had to been taken very early. And uh, those of us who are arguing for early interventions, uh, even after, you know, we'd passed the time when a global travel shutdown would have been, but early interventions in the UK, uh, which I, I was in January and February, were greatly handicapped because the World Health Organization didn't even declare this to be a pandemic until March the 11th, 2020. So it's all very well for people like me to be advising government or going on the TV and the radio and saying, this is really serious, we have to take action now. And the World Health Organization hasn't even called it a pandemic. That, that really isn't helpful. So I, I think it is important that all of us realize the seriousness of the situation earlier. And that actually does include the World Health Organization. They, they didn't respond quickly enough and appropriately enough in my, in my view. And we have one last, one last question. question. Um, five main, main takeaways, takeaways, five points, points to, prevent to prevent future, future pandemics, pandemics on a global scale. scale. But to, to summarize, summarize, I mean, you've, you've already hinted at loads of different measures, measures and steps, steps, but, you know, it's something, something that maybe not, maybe not we all can do, but we can also all be, you know, look out for, because, because as you say, there are you know, SARS, SARS trees and other things out there that might well um, rear their heads in the future. So the absolutely key measure is early detection and early characterization of an emerging infectious disease event. Um, and that's something that people have been working on for literally decades. This is nothing new. Um, again, it turned out just from practical experience for those working in the field, that waiting for the WHO to be told about a new infectious disease wasn't actually quick enough, that often the pandemic will be well underway or the, or the outbreak will be well underway by the time the official channels to work. So for example, this is, this is quite an old initiative, but it gives you an example of the kind of thinking uh, there's a project called Health Map. You can find it on Google, and it, it maps emerging infectious diseases events. And one of the tools it uses are web crawlers in multiple languages that look for reports in the media and in the grey literature to do with emerging infectious diseases. And you asked for five, but we're running out of time, and I'm only going to give you that one. Early detection. Uh, and then 
early action. Two, two, I have got to do. Early detection and early action. Those are the absolute keys. And that you can see how the failure to achieve either of those in 2019, 2020, sowed the seeds for what was to follow and the way that the pandemic fold out. So those are my two. Well, well thank, thank you so, so very much, much uh, Mark, for this wonderful talk. talk. And, and thank you to the audience for all the questions. And I'll apologize again, because I hear that my sound is still not, not okay. okay. So uh, really, uh, really sorry about that. We will investigate and make sure that for all the other events we're hosting, we will probably not have these sort of issues. Uh, uh, but thank, thank you so much. And, and please uh, do drop us some feedback on the event. event. Uh, the link is now in the YouTube chat, so you should be able to all see that. If you're in Orkney, you can make your way quickly to Stromness Hotel. Uh, uh, the Orkney International Science, Science Festival, of course, continues at 11 o'clock. There is a T4 transition uh, in Stromness Hotel. Um, and then at 11.30, if you're in Kirkwall, uh, DNA for vaccine targets phoning in on the Epstein Bar uh, is in Phoenix Cinema in Kirkwall. Or indeed, the next virtual event, um, with me actually hosting, uh, hopefully with much better sound, is at 3.30 uh, this afternoon. At the clock, the facts, and the caveness genius. And this is, of course, going to be uh, hosted on YouTube. YouTube and as, as, as usual. Uh, uh, in, the in the meantime, uh, if, you're if you're enjoying the festival, don't forget, forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, Twitter Instagram, Instagram, and of course follow our YouTube channel. But I say again, again, a great thanks to uh, Professor Mark Wilhouse uh, uh, for sharing uh, his, his insights, insights um, across, across what, what happened over the past not just year. You know, it's the world, the year, the world, the year, the year, the world went mad. It's actually been two years of relative madness, and we're only now slowly starting to emerge out of it. So thank you so much, Professor Wilhouse, and to everyone listening at home. Have a lovely afternoon.